Good morning and welcome to Behind the Screen. I am JM. This is a show where we hang out, we talk about games and things that we love, things that inspire us, things that are beautiful, that bring joy to our lives. Uh, good morning to Padre and Gram. Good to see both of you. Um, I'm chuckling because uh, one of my players, I run a Hyperborea game on Wednesday nights, and one of my players sent me a meme that uh, uh, it was Tink. Good morning, Tink. Uh, from Always Sunny in Philadelphia with uh, Charlie and Mac going, oh, did somebody get addicted to Dark Vision? Uh, because the group was heading down a stairwell and I mentioned that the light of the last torch doesn't reach this far. And they all kind of pause. They're like, wait, none of us can see in the dark? Well, what do we do? Well, you would light a torch. And, and so it was, an, it was an interesting moment. Um, again, Hyperborea. Did a couple of episodes on that. Go check them out. Adore that game. So, today we're going to... We're in our... Um, Anti-penultimate? Is that anti-ultimate? There's a word for the... Right before the penultimate. But Tuesday will be our penultimate episode looking at Wrath and Glory. At least for now. Um, today we're looking at the Forsaken System Player's Guide which is the overview of the Gilead system. And I would say, if you are going to get into Wrath and Glory after the core rulebook, this is probably the book you want to get. Um, pretty much immediately, in, in my opinion. One, it fleshes out the Gilead system, planet by planet. Morning, John. Uh, just let it be known that John Doom has challenged me to become the most invested player in his Savage Pathfinder Rise of the Rude Lords campaign. And uh, challenge accepted, my friend. Challenge accepted. So it goes planet by planet, and each planet has, I don't know, a half dozen or more adventure hooks. Yeah, maybe more like four to five, uh, depending on the planet. So not only do you get an overview of the planet, its moons what's going on there, but they give you five or six short adventure hooks. So, for example, on Netheris, which is the um, uh, the planet where, if I remember correctly, uh, the knights are fighting against the, the Imperial Knights, so the large building-sized uh, war machines are fighting against megafauna. One of the adventure hooks is Fallen Guardian. A new movement is spreading across all strata of Nethrin society and has become concerned to the lords of Gilead Primus and the representatives of the Veronius Flotilla. Originating in the Lismil Dominion, those who have embraced it claim that the lack of tithe ships arriving from beyond the Great Rift means that Terra has fallen and that the claims of Jackal Veronius notwithstanding. Furthermore, they warn that without enforcement from Terra to keep them in line, no off-worlder can be trusted. The movement serves as cover for heretical leanings and uh, piratical deeds among the rulers of Lismel, who have been allowing their land trains to falsely disappear near their land so they can steal the resources and further their own ends. And that is what you can expect from essentially the first 40 pages of this book. Just digging in, walking through each of the planets, and giving you some great adventure books. But when you're talking about a system, it's not just the planets. That's sort of boring. Right? Don't get me wrong, I enjoy lore, I enjoy looking at a setting. But really it's the people that make the setting interesting to me. And so the next section covers the factions of Gilead. And they give you an overview of the faction, kind of what training they may give to people, what their goals are, and how they relate to other factions. And essentially what this does is it takes each of the broad categories of frameworks in the Wrath and Glory core game and gives them a distinct Gilead system um, flair. So, for example, there's the Order of the Sanctified Shield, which is part of the administrator, Administrorum, but is focused on protecting shrines. And so, as you look through this, you get the symbols, the heroes, you know, where they 
uh, where they came from, what their goals are. There's one for the Mechanicus. They outline the chapter. Let's see if I can find that here. Do, do, do. The Absolvers, which is a um, the Space Marine chapter that's been cut off and is here in in Gilead, and so that gives you a whole Space Marine chapter to be a part of. But it doesn't just stop with the human factions. You've got a couple of Eldar factions. You've got a Chaos faction. You've got the Orc faction. The Blood Axes. Uh, you have a space... Uh, I said Chaos. So each one of these gives you a framework for a faction at play. Now, if you're running a Loyalist game, some of these factions are going to serve as enemies or antagonists to your characters and their frameworks. Others may not. Again, I think... And we'll talk about this next Thursday. I think the key to a good 40k game is not trying to do everything all at once. Or even everything all in the same campaign. Pick one or two solid antagonistic factions. And let the other ones just be operating in the back. Unless, of course, your players are like, well, we're going to search down any hint of chaos despite the fact that the Necrons and the Orcs are a threat. And then you pivot. Moving on, they kind of also put faces to the factions because there is a, a large selection of patrons, including a Chaos Space Marine. And what's interesting about this is the patrons serve as um, another thing to fine-tune your framework. Again, remember, frameworks in Warhammer, Wrath and Glory are... Um, the way you limit and focus a group. Giving them a patron helps refine that focus even more. It also serves as, I can say this from uh, having many discussions with him, Ross Watson, who did the original design on Wrath and Glory, is a big fan of having a solid quest giver um, in a setting for the players. Someone that they can always go to and say, okay, but what needs to be done? Uh, which I like, um, but also I feel like Patrons should be mysterious. They should be somewhat unknowable. When you do things for a patron, you're not always seeing the full picture. And that adds some, you know, ambiguity to patrons that uh, I enjoy in my games. I never want the PCs to feel like, oh, well, this person is 100% trustworthy. Because everyone, everyone has their own agendas and plans that may not always line up with what the players think is going on. But each of these patrons also gives you two new uh, two new frameworks specifically for working with that patron. I don't I don't think bad guy like John like oh it's going to he's going to betray you. But I also don't think that everything your patron tells you the, your patron's not required to tell you everything. I tend to run patrons very much like the Ace of Die are presented in uh, The Wheel of Time. A patron is most often not going to lie to you. But a patron's also not going to tell you the entire truth. They're going to tell you exactly what they need to tell you and you need to hear to get the job done. Um, one of my favorite games that I've run was this game of Infinity, which is a science fiction uh, transhuman RPG by Modiphius based off the miniature game of the same name. And in that, you're all members of O12, which is sort of like Space UN. But you're all also coming from these other factions, and depending on how deep you want to go, you can say that there are the O12 missions are always altruistic and will never clash with your individual factions. Or we played what's called Wilderness of Mirrors, which is very uh, Lakar kind of uh, inspired setting where, hey, the O12 gives you the missions and then your faction handler gives you your specific missions. Like make a copy of the data that O12 wants destroyed and bring it back. Leave a listening device in the ambassador's quarters while you protect them. That sort of thing. 
and yeah, I mean, I, I would not necessarily have the patron be the big bad evil guy, John, because I, I, I think you're right, especially in 40k, they're going to be looking for that. If I did do something like that, and again, we're, we're drifting into what I, what I was going to talk about on you know next week when we wrap up the Wrath and Glory, I would make it a very um, insidious progression, not that the patron was the bad guy, but that the ruinous powers over the course of these missions have found some way to turn their secret desire into the hook and give the players a chance to ensure their patron does not fall to the ruinous powers or that they can deal with them. Um, but again, it is 40k. It is a morally gray world. So again, while I don't think it would be the big bad evil guy in my campaign, I would want a little bit of mistrust or... Right... When you look at like the Inquisition and the radical Inquisition, um, really what the the thing that you know separates a radical Inquisitor from you know a chaos cultist is really the outcome, not the methodology. So, uh, for example, if you wanted to follow the uh, Arch Domina. Uh, Azerka Vakul, who is a member of the Adaptus Mechanicus, they give you two frameworks that you can work with. Uh, Mech Evangelists, where you are a motley team from Desperate Origins that are employed to achieve clandestine aims. They give you sample missions, they give you lim your limitations, what war gear, This, in this case you get a servo skull, or you can be the hammer and or the anvil. You're handpicked for your toughness and ruthless efficiency. You're a team of cybernetic warriors and specialists tasked with enforcing the will of the Omnissiah. You had a combat servitor in that case. And again, these go from the Imperium side to the Eldari, to the Orcs, Warboss, Vazdrox, Spiky Smasha, Agents of the Wa. Ah. Frameworks are D D Intelligent Intelliglitz, and the Ard Boys. And of course you get a good Chaos uh, Lord to have as a patron. Or as an enemy patron. Um, yeah, probably Ordo Hereticus or Ordo Xenos. Mark, good to have you here. Um, so that uh, covers only the first 90 pages of this 142 page supplement. Because there's now new character options. Do you want to play as a Rattling, or an Ogren, or a Crute? That's now available to everyone here. And there's a ton of new um, archetypes. Sisters Repentia, uh, Seraphim, Imagifiers, uh, Canonists from the Sisters of Battle side of things. If you want to play uh, an Apothecary, or a Chaplain, or a Librarian for the Astartes, or a Primaris Raver, um, Tech Adepts, again, the Sicarians just weird me out, but you can play as a Sicarian, especially if you would like your uh, your brain replaced with cybernetics and your memory wiped. Rattling Snipers, Ogres, Vulgrins. Uh, if you haven't played... I'm talking about uh, 40k, the new Darktide game, which is basically Left for Dead or Vermintide, but in 40k. They just redid did a patch that redid um, a ton of the way characters advance in the game but i've always wanted to run a, a group with four ogren my, my son calls it the F the fogren strategy i don't think it would be very effective but it would be fun to just have you know four ogren spouting their voice lines as you go running through chaos cultists and then of course you get a rattling sniper um crude warrior and at the end of it, the last 10 pages are endeavors, which are downtime actions between adventurers. And if you know anything about me, I adore uh, downtime actions. So again, 150 page book for $40. They seem to manage to keep their books between 30 and 40 bucks, which I appreciate. Again, quality is spectacular. Writing, binding, art, just great. And again, like I said, this is probably the first book I would buy after the core rulebook because of how much information it gives on the setting and how many options it gives to your players. And 
for a GM who is looking for a way to bring Wrath and Glory to life, the adventure hooks, the factions, the patrons, they're all top tier and help you narrow down that focus to get your game kind of wedded to a razor's edge, which is really where you want it when the universe is the limit. So on Tuesday, uh, so next week, uh, behind the screen is going to be, you'll get your notifications about an hour early than uh, normal. We're going to try and go live around uh, a little around nine o'clock central because um, I'm going to be at Board Game Geek Con with Pinnacle next week, um, do demoing Doom Guards. So if you're in the Dallas area coming to uh, Board Game Geek convention, come by the Carolina Game Tables and uh, say hi, try Doom Guard out. It's going to be me and Clint and Jody and Mike and uh, Simon. So it should be a ton of fun. So I've got to do those early because I've got to get down to the convention center on time for our um, for our events. And tonight I will be on uh, the Peg channel on Savage Universe talking with uh, Carl from Tabletop Tango talking about how do we take other adventures that we love and bring them over to Savage Worlds. So, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay gaming. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. And uh, whether it's here on Twitch or on YouTube, thank you all for your support. Give a like, give a subscribe, give a thumbs up. Uh, we are close. We're under under 40. I think we're under 35 people to hitting 1,000 subscribers. Again, we're going to a, do a big giveaway of the Fading Suns books here on... Um, When we hit a thousand uh, subscribers, we'll do a, a big kind of celebratory event. So until then, I'll see you all on Tuesday and have a good one.